Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience DFS Edge crossover presented by Jägermeister. Give your beer a real shot this summer. An ice cold shot. A Jägermeister. We're continuing our chat about the top overall ADPs. We've already done the first three rounds. Now we're getting into round four and just finishing out the top 50 players overall by ADP. Adam Levitan, the host of the DFS Edge, is here with me. And as he'll probably tell you, you got to give the episode a like along the way, plus rate, review, and subscribe to the audio podcast version. Did I get that right, Levy? Uh, this whole iTunes game thing actually really tilts me, you know, like the best way to rise on iTunes is to have no listeners, make sure you get no listeners. And then all of a sudden get a bunch that sends you up to the top, right? Or maybe you tell your audience to uh, go into the reviews and like do some contests in their reviews. And all of a sudden you shoot up to the top, right? It's not just about who gets the most downloads. It's not about who has the most listeners. It's all these gaming things to get to the top. And, and that really tilts me. So no, uh, Mayo, I won't be telling the people to like and review and all that nonsense. All right, so well, I was starting so, well, to laugh too, well, Mayo. Well, hold, hold go, on. Go the, the one thing that you want to do is then go to the Pat Mayo Experience iTunes <laughs> reviews. Leave every, hey, even if they're negative comments, just go leave those right there. I was starting to laugh too because you were obviously, you know, I was, I'm sure Levy will tell you, like, review, whatever. And I'm thinking to myself, there's no way Levy gives a crap about any of that. <laughs> well, this is why we. <laughs> he couldn't begin to care less. This is why we need crossover episodes. You got, you got three completely different perspectives coming at this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, prob probably long overdue, but that's that's a good thing. Yeah, and, you know, I don't even know. Maybe you guys know, by the way, this has nothing to do with what we're going to do with the round four ADPs. And hi, Adam Kaufman, by the way, if, if you didn't know that. And the, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll hold, hold on one second. In the comments no, section, please, yeah. you know, in the comment section, please leave stuff like Kaufman's just ruining this because he won't talk about football. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I do want to know because I, I, I want to learn. Maybe you guys can educate me or somebody can leave a comment and tell me how it works. You go onto iTunes and you check out your podcast or whatever, and it's got that popularity bar or it measures in the top 10 of whatever specific search or sport or whatever, and your popularity bar varies from within your singular show versus others. What the hell's the popularity bar mean? And is that even remotely indicative of listeners? I have no clue. No, I don't think so. I think yeah, I think like, you can't even get accurate reports from iTunes. So I think they're just putting stuff up there and be like, oh, that, that, that maybe we'll call this one popular and this one not popular. And you're just like, I, I guess I got to go with it. It's the only information I got. It's all proprietary info. Uh, yeah, I, the, to me, it's it's so inaccurate that it's not even it's not even worth looking at. I, I, the best is when people go on Twitter and pat themselves on the back. They're like, we just started a new podcast and it's number five on iTunes. Everybody who starts a new podcast and gets like a thousand downloads is all of a sudden in the top five in iTunes. So uh, I don't know. Uh, we don't have to talk about this anymore. I, it's just, uh, I'm just tilted. All right. So, we, all right. So, where do we go next? Well, we left off last episode with you and talking about sex chat at like a summer camp. Or oh, something like right, that. right, right, right. So, well, so, I mean, not. Let's hear it. Uh, Oh, I was going to say not in a vulgar way, but I guess there's really no other way to talk about sex than in a at least implied vulgar way. But yeah, you well, so Levy asked me the wildly inappropriate question as to whether I ever screamed out a Celtics player's name in the middle of uh, being in the bedroom, to which the answer is no. But it reminded me of a story from back in college at Syracuse guy who uh, he, he actually works in the NFL now, so I won't name drop him as <laughs> you wouldn't want me to. But he uh, used to write for uh, the uh, whatever the paper was at Syracuse, Post Standard or, or, or Daily Orange or whatever it was. And so he did this feature story on uh, Dwight Freeney, who we remember was in the NFL for a while. And uh, he was really proud of it. And so he like cut out, didn't, not classy with a frame or anything, just literally like took a scissors and cut out the story and taped it to his wall right over his bed. L like, like, a serial, he, like a serial killer does. Like a still, yeah. I mean, it, he he did like cut out individual letters and try and spell something, but pretty much like a serial killer would. And so he had a uh, a a lady friend over one time, and they were doing what they were doing. And in his uh, moment of heightened passion, I'll call it, he high fives Dwight Freeney over the bed, right smack in the middle of everything. And uh, I laugh every time I think about that story. <laughs> Uh, we should have Dwight Freeney on the show to discuss. To discuss. Just to react to that, yeah. Yeah.
I mean, probably made him feel good to, to be included. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everyone just wants to be a part of things. I think the reason that we yeah. spent so long trying to get into this is sort of indicative of Aaron Rodgers, the next guy up in this ADP list. He's at 37. Deshaun Watson's at 47. We talked about it a little bit on the last show, but like, just don't draft quarterbacks. This is how meaningless it is. We'll talk about Coffin's friend's sex life instead of talking about drafting quarterbacks <laughs> early. All right, well, let's let's review round four. I'll, I'll at least throw out the names, uh, whatever it is, 37 through 48 and what we're looking at. And, uh, you know, we've already spent time on, on previous shows on a couple of these guys. So uh, right now, it is Aaron Rodgers, like you said, at the top, and then Alex Collins, Darius Geis. We've already talked about them in, in episode three, so if you haven't listened to that one, you want to learn about those guys, please go back and do. Zach Ertz, so you got a tight end, the second on this list, Rob Gronkowski, who was back in round two. Allen Robinson, Jay Ajayi, Kenyon Drake, the former teammates, uh, Darius uh, Demarius Thomas, pardon me, Juju Smith-Schuster, and uh, Amari Cooper, and then you got uh, Deshaun Watson and Sony Michel there, the Patriots rookie, who is obviously unproven. We don't know what to expect from him. But let's begin with those QBs, kind of bookending the round, and that's Rodgers, it's Watson. Considered the top two guys in your fantasy drafts in terms of ADP. And, you know, let's, let's just go right there, Levy. Is Rodgers clear-cut coming back from the injury the number one and really kind of same story for Deshaun Watson is he your obvious number two even ignoring that you're not going to take either one of them that high yeah I think Aaron Rodgers for sure they just have such a high passing rate in the red zone and Aaron Rodgers touchdown expectation is just so 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 massive on a week to week basis we know uh what the Packers are going to do from a play calling perspective we know they're going to put points on the board through the pass game. Um, so yeah, I think Aaron Rodgers for sure. Deshaun Watson, I uh, talked about on one of the earlier shows about outliers. I mean, um, I am always concerned with extreme regression, but Deshaun Watson was just so impressive. Like it's crazy as a rookie to go into Seattle, uh, even though Seattle's defense was not what it used to be and like do what he did up there. And he had so many huge games. I and mean, even though he only played like six or seven, like every game was just absolutely eye popping. So uh, would I take him second quarterback overall? I don't think uh, I'll end up having him there. But uh, if you believe he'll be anywhere close to last year, uh, then, yeah, he belongs in the top QB, two, three, four, six spot. So, Mayo, before you go, then, who would be your number two? If it's Rodgers, then it's who? Is it the reigning MVP but aging Tom Brady? Is no. it somebody else? No, it's not. I, I'm, sorry to <laughs> break, you I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to break your heart there, uh, Goff. It's probably not going to be Tom Look, Brady. Look, all, all I know, it may be a Super Bowl loss, but he's coming off of 550 yards or whatever in that game. So the guy's still pretty good. But <laughs> Levy before Mayo, who is your second guy? Uh, see, I didn't even thought about this because I would never take one of these guys, but I, I think <laughs> Russell Wilson with the deteriorating state of Seattle's defense, um, could have a really big year. I think Cam Newton has so many weapons, um, and will continue to get a lot of, uh, rushing expectation, a lot of rushing goal line expectation. I think he makes sense. And Deshaun Watson is, is right there too. Um, and Tom Brady is right there too. You know, that's the thing about quarterback. Like it's just so close and there's so many that, um, there's really not a reason to spend a lot of capital on them. Well, I mean, I, I think for the top three for me is going to be like Rodgers, Wilson, Watson, and I'm trying to figure out the exact order that I want to put them in. I, I just have a Watson question for you, Levy. Like, let, let's say we factor in the regression that obviously that Deshaun Watson can't sustain that pace that he was at last year. And you just take his stats and cut 15% of them off or 20% of them off. He's still like a top three guy, isn't he? And, and not only that, but you are looking at a really small, small sample, right? So it's really dangerous to be like, if we extrapolated his stats over a 16 game season, they would be absolutely off the wall. Well, uh, we could do that with a lot of guys who had really good five or six game stretches. Um, so yeah, I think you have to factor in regression. I think you have to factor in small sample. I think you have to factor in uh, ACL. I think you have to factor in he'll be facing uh, the Jaguars defense twice, which is obviously the best pass defense in the league. So yeah, I think there's some concerns with Deshaun Watson. I'd be real hesitant to be like, Oh, let's just uh, extrapolate his stats over 16 games. See, I, I, love I know there's regression. Are you really going to knock off 20% Mayo? I mean, if let's, let's, let's say coming off the knee injury, the fact that he punched above his head, at least in terms of stats and where he rated out like fantasy points per game to all other quarterbacks, he was significantly better. So I'm just saying, if you knock off 20%, and just say that's what he does for the season as a pace and plays all 16 games, I still think that would put him inside the top three in terms of fantasy scoring. So let's say that the regression doesn't come. Maybe he's just this good. Uh, then all of a sudden, you know, you're doing really well. Deshaun Watson's a really tough one for me because I love him this year. I want to have him 
on my teams, but I didn't expect him to go as the number two quarterback and go inside the top 50. I thought the people would be scared off by the knee injury and being like, oh, the Texans really only have one receiver, da 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 da, and everything that comes along with it. But people just are not buying those narratives at all. The only narrative that they're buying is Deshaun Watson is really awesome. So if I was going to have any one of these guys, Russell Wilson's going at number 64. Like that's 15 picks later. I'd rather just have that. Agreed. You as well, Levy? Oh, oh, yeah. I, I mean, Russ is um, – talk about Russ a lot. Uh, I think um, once he got married uh, to Ciara, things started to get a little rocky, but uh, I think he has straightened it out a little bit. And if you want more uh, on the data that we have on team sex versus uh, team no sex <laughs> and, and Russ Wilson, we all know about his infamous uh, virginity uh, with Ciara um, – then yeah, you can go listen to previous episodes of the DFS Edge to to find the data that we found on that. Well, I, so do you have the stats to do you have the stats to back up the relationship too between Aaron Rodgers and Olivia Munn when they were together? Because she's she there's some data probably backing things up for her as well. She's a, I, I'm not going to spell it out. People can Google if they want, but she's a little infamous uh, in in her past, a little promiscuous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so we're running the Sims. We're in the lab. We're trying to figure out uh, you know, what's better, it, you know, team no sex or team sex. Uh, actually, uh, if you go back to my Twitter on, on June 21st, there was a big article about the World Cup, how uh, Mexico had a sex party. Uh, Germany forbade uh, sex before their World Cup game. And then it turned out that Mexico went out and won the game as an underdog. So, uh, you know, just another feather in the cap of, of team sex there. But we'll see. We're still working on it. Uh, I'm not. It depends. I guess it depends on how many teams I play with these quarterbacks. But, like, I want to have some Deshaun Watson somewhere. Like, maybe I just play him every week in DFS. Although, Levy, I saw your article about, like, the DraftKings quarterbacks and how it's pretty crazy to take expensive quarterbacks if you want to try to, like, win a millionaire maker. Yeah, uh, there is a lot of data out there about cheap quarterbacks, and it's for so many reasons. I mean, first and foremost, uh, opportunity, right? Like, the, most of the time on DraftKings when you pay – and even in season long, when you pay a uh, premium for something, you're paying for opportunity, right? We're paying their Le'Veon Bell's 25 touches. Most quarterbacks are going to fall in the same range of dropbacks per game, of pass attempts per game. Yeah, certain guys are going to, you know, have uh, more pass attempts than others, but every one of them will have the ball in their hands on every snap. Every one of them will drop back around the same time. So then you just start worrying about efficiency instead of opportunity. And that's why there's so many guys uh, that are available late. And then, yeah, you know, um, spending little at quarterback on DraftKings makes sense because um, you are you are able to spend up uh, obviously on guys where you need salary, you need opportunity at the running back and wide receiver. The guys who have the highest ceilings there are often uh, very expensive, and we are in fact playing with a salary cap. So yeah, I think similar to, to DraftKings and season long is the devaluation of quarterbacks. It's just a pretty simple theory there. I think at this point, almost everybody is pretty aware of it. So Aaron Rodgers being the top guy and, you know, we can all debate whether he should go as high as he is in ADP. And you guys certainly don't like him in that spot. Levy in general doesn't like quarterbacks that high uh, or, or maybe in the first eight rounds if he had his druthers. But Mayo would prefer to wait until round five. We talked about that in the past and a little bit here on this show. But uh, it, for, for Rodgers being that top guy and coming back from the injury, is it more about, hey, he's Aaron Rodgers, so he's going to do Aaron Rodgers things? Or is it the weapons around him and kind of a new look offense. How much of that balancing act is there, Mayo? I don't think there is. You just you take Aaron Rodgers because he makes everyone around him so good. And you give him Jimmy Graham. Obviously, he has the connection with Devontae Adams. Randall Cobb is much better when he's around. And frankly, they haven't figured out their pass game. And the sneaky part about Rodgers, and maybe he doesn't run as much when he comes back, but he's always liable to chuck in you know, a few touchdowns here and there with his legs, pick up a few first downs. I always like to think of Russell Wilson and Aaron Rodgers in kind of similar terms. I think they're actually more similar quarterbacks than people realize. Obviously, Wilson runs more, but I wouldn't really consider Wilson a running quarterback. He tends to run when the opportunity presents itself and he has 20 yards downfield or he needs a first down to take off. There's not a lot of designed runs when it comes to Russell Wilson, uh, the same way that there's not when it comes to Aaron Rodgers, but both of them will take off if the opportunity is there. So I, I just think that you can parse a lot of Aaron Rodgers' stats from someone like Russell Wilson at two and a half rounds of value. Yeah, um, Aaron Rodgers has proven repeatedly that quality of weapons is not that important. You know, if Geronimo Allison wins a number three job, I think he would be an interesting sleeper, and Geronimo Allison is not much of a player. So, so yeah, I, I don't really think it matters. 
there's one tight end in this group, and that is Zach Ertz. And so, you know, I know that in general, you guys would probably, I don't know, maybe you, you're comfortable with round four starting to think about your tight ends, not earlier when we were doing Rob Gronkowski in round two or round three when it was Travis Kelsey. But when it's 25 to, I don't know, 31 or whatever Kelsey was to now 40 at Zach Ertz, there's some clear separation there in the overall ADP. But, Levy, how much separation is there between those three guys specifically to you? Like, is it worth going up for one of them because you want to make sure you get the top guy, or do you not really care as long as you get one of those three? Uh, you must have misheard me earlier. I, I was on board with Gronk, you know, in the late second, early third. I was on board with Travis Kelsey in the third, in the third is, is particularly in, sh in, uh, in shallower leagues. Um, uh, maybe I, I'm thinking of Mayo. Yeah, you were thinking yeah. of me. I think that getting one of the top three tight ends, uh, the tier is very clear to me. Um, Zach Ertz, obviously, was a target monster in the short range. Uh, Trey Burton gone now. They did draft Dallas go there. But I think that um, he's not going to play a lot. This is Zach Ertz's um, team. He has so much chemistry. I believe Zach Ertz and and Carson Wentz, like, go to church together. They're, they're like boys. Like, they, like, uh, really, like, um, like, I don't want to say roommates, but. There's something going on with those two. So, so anyways, I, I, I think Zach Ertz, I would put him in the same tier as Kelsey uh, and Gronk, maybe not quite as explosive down the field. But, but yeah, I have no problem whatsoever with Zach Ertz in the fourth round either, just like I didn't with Gronk in the late second or, or Travis Kelsey in the third. Yeah, for me, it wasn't so much that I dislike Gronk and I dislike Kelsey. It's just that I think that Ertz is very close to them when you look at final season points in a PPR league just where he's going to garner so many targets over and just having that consistent presence at tight end is so, so valuable that I would just pass on the first two and get Zach Ertz because I, I haven't done shuck out or finished up my final rankings yet, but like I, I could see myself ranking Zach Ertz number one just because of safety purposes. Like you just have him in. If he doesn't get hurt, plug him in. He's going to get close to 90 catches. If he plays full, fifth, full 16 games, he might challenge double-digit touchdowns. You give up some of the ceiling that comes with the explosiveness like levy mentioned the down the field ability of gronk and kelsey but it seems like it's gonna be tough to say with gronk like we, we talked about it before like hey if you think brady's gonna have a good year gronk has to have a good year because of lack of weapons at least i know when wentz comes back and even when Foles is there now with burton gone especially that zach Ertz is just gonna garner so much attention in the passing game that he could challenge around 10 targets a game and I, i'm just sign me up for that so the next two guys in terms of tight ends anyway, and it's future rounds and you got to wait like 20 picks again, based on ADP, but it's, uh, it's going to be Jimmy Graham who now with the Packers is going to be Greg Olson as well. That top tier is that top tier for a reason, those three guys, and there's that drop off for a reason, but just based on your tight end production, the QBs that they have, uh, you know, throwing the ball to them, would you be comfortable levy waiting and getting one of those other two guys before you really kind of get into the thick of it with other tight ends or, or is it very important to get one of those top three wherever it is that you have to get them? Yeah, uh, if I missed on one of the top three, I would probably wait longer than that Jimmy Graham, Greg Olson tier. I, I have concerns about Jimmy Graham. The way he looked last year was like so stiff. Like all he could do was go down into the end zone and box people out. Um, and that was scary to me because I thought he was set up really well uh, with the Seahawks to have a really good year. He just did not look athletic whatsoever. Um, and Greg Olson scares me too, you know, one foot, in the television booth, seems to be waffling there in retirement. They add uh, DJ Moore in the first round. We know Christian McCaffrey is going to be a big factor. We know Devin Funches uh, is going to be a big factor. So uh, we know Cam Newton is going to run for some touchdowns. So, yeah, I would go ahead and pass on that uh, Jimmy Graham, Greg Olson tier if I missed out on the top three. And, and we can get some sleepers in some later shows, I think, that are interesting uh, if you do wait on uh, tight end. Yeah, I wouldn't hit up this middle tier of tight end. I don't think there's a big distinction between Jimmy Graham and some of the other guys down below. Like the guy every single year that you can wait on because no one ever wants to draft him is Delaney Walker. And if we're talking for PPR purposes, like the guy is just going to churn out points every week. He's not going to be great, but he'll probably finish the year as like tight end number six. And right now his ADP is coming in like at around the same spot as Trey Burton, who I feel like is being overdrafted just a little bit. Like he's coming at number 80 right now, Delaney. Walker it just feels to me like if when you get into your draft he's going to go later than that because there is no sex appeal attached to Delaney Walker whatsoever how about the uh, receivers you know some of the guys we mentioned them earlier and it's it's an interesting kind of group because it's Allen Robinson now with Chicago and then you get to Marius Thomas Juju Smith-Schuster 
Amari Cooper, at least in, in this grouping here. And I, I don't know, to me, that's kind of a, a different class. Like if, if I'm looking at, and for me, I, and this is, the, this is like your, your average regular guy kind of drafting theory, and maybe some of it is tied to a name, but I'm more interested in, even with the the situation in Pittsburgh, knowing that he's obviously not the number one guy, but I'd rather go to Juju Smith-Schuster than I would look at Allen Robinson in Chicago with Trubisky throwing at him. But, uh, you know, how, how closely do you rank these guys, Mayo? Uh, I think they're all pretty close. Like, I would prefer to have Allen Robinson than Juju right now. Like, he's still playing... When we're talking about, like, target share, Juju's probably still third on the team behind Antonio Brown and behind Le'Veon Bell, quite frankly. With Allen Robinson, you could see yourself as, you know, almost an alpha situation in Chicago. If Trubisky actually turns out to be good, and Levy alluded to it before, now that you have Nagy in there and not that god-awful John Fox, maybe they can figure Hmm. out a semblance of offense. I know a lot of people are projecting that onto Trey Burton, but listen, Allen Robinson put up numbers with Blake Bortles. You don't think he can do it with Trubisky? Uh, the concern for me on Allen Robinson is he hasn't been good in like, what is it now? Two and a half years or like maybe even three years. Like um, even when he was healthy, uh, when we last saw Allen Robinson, he was bad. And maybe some of that was based on quarterback play, but I didn't think Allen Robinson was playing that well. Uh, can he get it back uh, coming off the ACL tear? Uh, certainly. Uh, is it likely? I don't want to say that it's necessarily uh, likely, but I do think that they'll be scheming him the ball. I do think Matt Nagy, uh, knows what he's doing. I do think Trubisky uh, is capable. So it's an interesting um, situation there. I would probably rather go with Jay Jai in this range. We haven't touched on yet, but but yeah, uh, Allen Robinson is certainly interesting. Well, I think Demarius Thomas is the super interesting guy here because I don't know if he's like past his prime, he's lost a step, or he's just been dealing with awful quarterbacks for the last two years. But like Case Keenum is a significant upgrade over everything that Denver's been running out. And he's still putting up great PPR points every year, very consistent, but nothing elite. He's just sort of a floor guy every single season. But like 83 receptions last year, 141 targets, like – if he gets 141 targets again, like I'm pretty sure that he's going to have over 1,000 yards, it's still really only him and Emmanuel Sanders that are patrolling out there for the Broncos. Like I could see him moving up. I just don't know how far I would want to put him up. It seems like a very good spot for him in terms of value, like just knowing what you're going to get and baking a little upside because of the improved quarterback. Yeah. So, Mayo, for, or, uh, or Levy, sorry, for him personally, is Bradford enough of an upgrade? Keenum. Or not Bradford, Keenum. Um, yeah, the thing that you get with Demarius Thomas is it's like so focused in the target tree, you know, they don't really have a tight end they use in the pass game, maybe Jake Butt gets there this year, but I kind of doubt it. Uh, They don't really use running backs in the pass game that much. They don't use their number three wide receiver that much. It's like all Demarius and Manny Sanders. So I think there's a lot to be said for that when you're doing an evaluation and a projection. Um. Is Demarius Thomas still elite from just a talent-based perspective? I think you could argue uh, maybe not, but when you're getting him in the fourth round here, I think it's okay. I don't know. I I hadn't really thought a ton about him. I haven't played him much the last two years. He's just been over-owned so much by people relative to his ceiling as the Broncos play it so tight to the vest. So um, it's more exciting to me to take shots on Allen Robinson, Juju, Amari Cooper, um guys like that then it would be Demarius but um yeah I don't think it's a a terrible idea especially if you have some higher risk plays uh in your first three picks are are we just talking around Amari Cooper at number 46 because like I I just I've never owned Amari Cooper I've never quite got what everyone sees with him but it seems like people are everybody always bitches and moans when they own Amari Cooper yeah so for the edge listeners um it's a running joke with Amari Cooper uh Peter has probably lost, uh, I would say, around like $1.1 1. 1 or $1. $1.2 million on, on Amari Cooper over, over, the last, uh, <laughs> over the last couple of years. Um, we're not really exaggerating. Uh, it's kind of like a situation where the talent has not translated to on-field production, and a lot of it has had to do with drops. And I normally don't worry about drops, but it got to the point where quarterbacks were afraid, uh, all the Raiders quarterbacks, including Carr, were afraid to kind of target Amari because he dropped so many balls in the red zone. They always went to Crabtree. Uh, Obviously, Crabtree is gone now. They brought in Jordy Nelson, who I do not think has much left in the tank. Martavis Bryant may or may may not be suspended. A new coach, Jay Gruden, who uh, I'm not really sure he knows what he's doing from a personnel perspective, but one thing that he did say is uh, we're going to focus our offense around Amari Cooper. So, um, you know, it's always scary 
to go with a guy who's let people down so many times over the last couple of years, but the talent is still there. Mark Cooper is still incredibly young. Uh, and I think his coaches have identified him as a key player. So I would probably go ahead and take Amari uh, over Demarius Thomas, over uh, Kenyon Drake, over Darius Geis, over guys like that. Would you take him over Juju? Oh man. Speaking of young, Juju is like literally 21 years old. Like the, 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 if you do like an age adjustment on Juju season last year, it's so outrageous what he was able to do. Um, obviously getting rid of Martavis Bryant, I think is big for Juju's projection. Um, I really close, you know, certainly more reliable quarterback play, more reliable scheme uh, for Pittsburgh. I'll go ahead and take Juju over uh, Amari Cooper if, if forced to that decision. You know, Mayo, just to expand that conversation, I, it's a good segue. I wanted to do this next. But when you're looking at sort of the – you have a range, and this dives into after the 50s and into round five a little bit, but you have a range of guys that are basically all within about 10 of one another, and it's a few that we've already mentioned, obviously. It's, it's you know, Allen Robinson kind of at the top, but then Demarius Thomas, Juju Smith-Schuster, Amari Cooper, Alshon Jeffrey, Golden Tate, Brandon Cooks. I'm not going to bother asking you to rank, you know, are, are they in the right order, but is there a clear cut top couple of guys or are they all just so really bunched together? I, I think they're incredibly bunched together. Like I think you could even move Elshon Jeffrey, who's at number 50 up into that mix as well, that like you're going to have to get lucky and pick the right one. Maybe they're all good. And then it's not really that big of a conversation. Cooper probably presents the most upside from a talent market share perspective where you just juju is not going to get 35 percent market share or 30 percent market share outside of very strict outlier games because so much has to go to brown so much has to go to bell so you're relying on a lot of big plays and talent and those are never guys that i really like to target however i think it depends on how i construct my team to be perfectly honest with you like if i'm talking about let's say i don't get one of the first three picks chances are i'll probably end up with the receiver in the first round or end up with the receiver in the second round and it does get to the point where yeah you always want to take the best player available but if i've taken two receivers and a tight end i might have to start looking at running back around here and the only guys that are popping up are ajayi and kenyan drake and I'm not even sure what the Kenyon Drake situation is going to be. If you could guarantee me that it was going to be something like the end of last year where he was just the man on the field and all they did was run and pass to Kenyon Drake, like I, I would move him up inside my top 20. I'd have no problems taking Kenyon Drake, but I don't know how that's going to shake out. I don't have the strong feelings for Ajayi like Levy does, but like, what's the, what's the deal with Kenyon Drake, Levy? Is like Frank Gore going to be like a real problem? Uh, one thing that uh, struck me, uh, Evan Silva said recently, is, is that coaches love players like Frank Gore, right? Like super reliable, incredible in pass protection, uh, gets what's blocked, you know? So a lot of times coaches end up playing guys like Frank Gore more than they should uh, at the expense of more talented guys like Kenyon Drake. Uh, you hit on it with Kenyon Drake last year uh, when he was good, when he was like a must play on DraftKings, he had the Le'Veon Bell role, he had the Todd Gurley role, he had the David Johnson role, three downs plus goal line, huge factor uh, in the pass game. I don't think that Kenyon Drake will have that role uh, this year to the same degree. I think Miami uh, will be bad once again. So uh, I prefer Jay Ajayi, who um, Jay Ajayi uh, got 55% of the Eagles running back carries over the last six games last year, including the playoffs. And now LeGarrette Blunt is gone, came over in, offseason tra in a midseason trade last year, now has the entire offseason to work with the team. Um, he's battling with Corey Clement. He's battling with Darren Sproles. I don't think those are huge obstacles for Jay Ajayi to overcome. Uh, I think we could see him get up towards 60, 65% of the Eagles running back carries on a very, very good team with a very, very, very good offensive line. So uh, I'm more encouraged by the spot uh, for Jay Ajayi. Uh, yeah, you're not going to get 300 touches. You're not going to get 20, 25 carries a game, but I think you will get uh, a lot of solid production out of Jay Ajayi is certainly safer to me than, than Kenyon Drake. Is he someone who'd be better in standard leagues than PPR? Yeah, you know, they used Corey Clement a lot around the goal line last year, which was weird because you would think that Jay Ajayi is a little bit bigger and, and he would do it. Uh, that would concern me. I'm interested to see preseason usage around the goal line uh, for the Eagles. But yeah, I think Jay Ajayi should earn his way to more red zone and goal line looks. It just, just doesn't make a lot of sense to use Corey, Coleman and to, uh, Corey Clement a lot down there couple other running backs at the end of this round and into the fifth. You know, you got uh, Sony Michelle there for New England and also Mark Ingram, Mayo, your favorite there for the Saints. Is this – I guess I'll ask Levy because I know what you'll say, Mayo. You'll say too high. Is this too low for Mark Ingram based on what he did last year or is it just the suspension and the fact that he's going to miss the first quarter of the year that puts him here? 
Yeah, so in season long, I think something people forget when they're talking about suspended players or, or hurt players at the beginning of the year is early in the year is the best time to have these situations happen. There's no bye weeks. Uh, your team hasn't been ravaged by injuries yet. It's later in the year where you start to get really thin. You start after cutting guys just so you can feel the roster because everybody's hurt. There's these huge bye weeks, et cetera. So yeah, I'm willing to take shots on guys specifically that are suspended. Uh, Mark Ingram is an awesome talent. Uh, I do think that they'll be looking uh, to get him work. I know what people have said. Oh, they don't like uh, Mark Ingram. They like Kamara better. And while my, all that may be true, you can't tell me that Ingram will not help this team um, a lot. When he gets back, he'll be fresh. They don't want to load up Kamara uh, with too much. You know, there's guys like, I don't even know who they're going to try it out there. Terrence West and, um, you know, uh, like, I don't even know who else they have. Um, I do know, but it's not coming to me right now. Uh, Boston. Stop. I can pull up a depth chart. No, that's all right. It's just a bunch of stuff. <laughs> So, so, so yeah, I, I'm interested in Mark Ingram. Uh, the more he gets discounted because of the suspension, the more I'm interested in him. I mean, Mark Ingram did one thing that I actually do like, which is, you know, high praise for me about my mortal enemy, Mark Ingram. I always like guys uh, who did a quick cycle in the off season. I always think that helps people out. You get that, you get that steroid strength. You miss the four games. You're not injured. You come back bigger and badder than ever. Yeah. In case you're curious on the Saints, it's Ingram, it's Kamara, and then it's Daniel Lasko and Boston Scott, the rookie. Right. Yeah, and Boston so, Scott could, yeah. could impress early in the year, but yeah, I, I, I think that they'll come back and, and really work on marking or maybe it's also in a contract year. Like, why not run him into the ground and then let him go? So we 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 we, we <laughs> need a classic NFL. So so yeah. besides Levy and I, Coffin, we we need your Sony Michelle insights to the Patriots backfield. Yeah, I don't know what to anticipate from this guy. I mean, it. it it always feels a little bit high to take a running back in general. And, uh, you know, we, we've had that conversation about Saquon Barkley, particularly a team like the Patriots, though, drafting a running back that high. It just seems absurd. But you're still clearly, you know, we, we spent some time on the last show on Deion Lewis. He's gone. But there's Rex Burkhead. There's James White. There's um, whoever the hell that they brought in the offseason from uh, – Help me out, or I'll just pull it up here. The they, name is escaping they, they, me they, right they, now. They Jeremy said, Hill, but oh, yeah. Jeremy Hill. Yeah, Jer yeah, Jeremy Hill. So who knows? Like, it, and Brandon Bolden's back. Like, all these guys in all likelihood are not going to make the team in the first place. I could see Jeremy Hill potentially even getting cut, depending on how things go in camp. But Michelle, you don't know how to anticipate what kind of workload he is going to get, other than similar to Lewis. He's probably not going to do a ton in the passing game. He's going to be uh, the the most pure. Uh, running back, you know, physical specific running back that they have, you know, they can look to Burkhead to keep catching touchdowns and look to white to keep catching passes. And if Michelle somehow evolves, I don't, he won't be out of the gate, but evolves into your primary rusher, then sure. It seems like a good spot for him. I wouldn't be comfortable going, going as high as late fourth round for him though. I don't know about you guys. Well, I mean, we're not the ones who are like pitching out a tent behind Bill Belichick says hiding in the bushes, <laughs> trying to listen or, do whatever it is that you do outside of their cough. And so like, if you yeah, had, no, I did just, if, just listen. If you had to take one <laughs> of the Patriots running backs, would it be Burkhead? Cause that's where I'm leaning. I think I would take white, you know, I, it, Burkhead, well, there were the health issues last year for one. So that well, would concern it, me a little so, bit. So if, it, if well, looking, well, hold on. It's a good thing. We're not playing last year. We're playing this year then. No, it's true. I, I'm just looking at the immediate history. It's, it's relevant to me, I guess, but if, if I'm looking to pile up points with touchdowns, evidence would show last year Burkhead's your guy. So I understand that logic. If I'm looking for the guy that it feels like anyway is going to be targeted more, is going to have more receptions, just going to be more of a three-down guy, it's White. White is the guy that I would want to target there. But it's, it's not like it's one guy or the other in a landslide. The, the Patriots are like so smart and savvy and ahead of everybody else for them to take a running back in the first round was just like so jarring to me. Like I expect all the moron teams like the Giants and maybe maybe the Seahawks are more on team too. as they seem to be leaning that way. Like I was just shocked that they took a running back for them to do that. Um, I would think they had a massive grade on him and thought it was a spot of need. Uh, so oh, and Mike Gillisley's still there too, no, by the way. I was going to say Gillisley and Jeremy Hill are almost certainly going to get cut. I mean, I it, it's almost certain to me that it'll be Burkhead, James White, uh, Sony Michelle, and then Brandon Bolden in the special teams fourth running back role. But but anyways, you know, so I, I think that maybe we're underselling how much Sony Michelle uh, will be relied on by the Patriots. But yeah, it's certainly a gamble um, in the late fourth round. It does seem very high, and I think 
oftentimes we see rookies and drafts go really high, especially in the off season, because that's what everybody's been talking about. Like everybody's all excited about the rookies. Um, so maybe they go higher than they should, it, especially in early drafts. It just seems like a lot of his risk is baked into this ADP would be my, I guess my problem with that. I mean, he could be an excellent fantasy asset, but you're really gambling a lot at the end of the fourth round or potentially at the beginning of the fifth round when, well, last year, Goff, when the Patriots were mm-hmm. down receivers, didn't they start using Rex Burkhead in the slot a lot? Yeah, uh, th- there was a little bit of that. I just, well, I don't know. Hey, but isn't that to like, me, isn't that like a situation if Edelman, how long is Edelman going to be out for? Well, so provided this suspension sticks, which we don't even officially know yet, but it probably will because they usually do, then he'll miss the first quarter. But in terms of health, he's ready to come back. But he'll end up having to miss the first four games with the, you know, PED situation. But you do – it's. Uh, I guess what it comes back to is what is this Patriots offense – going to look like this year you know if Tom Brady is Tom Brady it's going to be good so I don't mean are they going to put up points I just mean stylistically like last year they didn't lean as much on Rob Gronkowski you had Brandon Cook so Tom Brady was going deep threat way more often than he has throughout his career other than like the Randy Moss year or, or years that he was around and then there was the slot reliance you didn't have Edelman but you had uh Chris Hogan was dealing with an injury, so he basically missed half the year. But Danny Amendola was available a lot of the time. Now, Edelman's going to miss time. Uh, Cooks is gone. Gronkowski is back. Amendola is gone. Hogan, you hope, is healthy. I just feel like they're going to look a little bit different stylistically than they did last year. And I don't know, short of leaning on Gronk, which I know I've said to you guys in past shows, I think they're going to do. I think there's going to be a lot of deference from Brady to Gronkowski. Other than that, Who's the clear-cut number two other, you know, at least in the weeks that before Edelman comes back? It's clearly Edelman when he's back. But prior to that, who's that clear-cut number two? And that's where it comes back to a guy like James White for me. I, I would just think that by drafting Michelle in the first round that we just might see a super run-heavy Patriots offense. Maybe. No. Maybe. Yeah. Here's uh, the thing with the Patriots in general. We've talked about this, whether it's on Manchester's Breakdown or, or you know, in, in, in shows like this. They're, they're such a game plan team, week-to-week team, that even though the numbers tend to be about what you expect them to be at the end of the year on an individual level, they'll prioritize the specific opponent over anything else. It's not like a lot of teams will go out and just say, like, we're going to worry about us, and we're going to do what we do, and, and they'll just try and stop it. That's not the Patriots. The Patriots try and exploit weaknesses and feature certain guys week to week that, you know, one week it could be Michelle going off for 150 yards because he ran the ball. 30 times, not anywhere near out of the gate, but later on as the season moves along, there'll be another week that he runs like six times for, you know, 30 yards. Cool. Yeah. I don't think that they're going to go uh, run heavy. I think the Patriots are too smart to that. They know in today's NFL going past heavy is the way to go. They still have Tom Brady playing at such a high level. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think that they'll go run heavy. That's not the concern. You brushed over the guy who uh, maybe we'll talk about in future shows, but to me, Chris Hogan, Hogan. is one of them. Yeah, one one of the best. I mean, for sure, one of the best plays right now at his current ADP. So we can talk about him uh, on a future show. But yeah, I don't want to gloss over him. I mean, he's going to have a big year. I'm I'm almost certain of it. Well, we got to get out of here so we can film some more of these shows where we can talk (laughs) a little bit more about Chris Hogan. So, Koff, where can people follow you at? Uh, Adam M. Kaufman. All right. It's it's really, it's Levy's favorite place to read. Just set set those notifications on. (laughs) Levy, you? (laughs) Yeah, I'm just uh, at Adam Levitan. We're obviously referring to Twitter here. You don't even have to say it anymore. Twitter is really the best thing ever. If anybody's listening to this and not on Twitter, like you are just absolutely uh, stoned out of your mind. So at Adam Levitan. (laughs) I mean, I I feel like if you were stoned out of your mind, you'd probably be on Twitter a lot. This is like all day. <laughs> it's just just stare, staring at your phone and being like, hey, new stuff. All right, I'm Pat Mayo. You can follow me at the PME. So if you want to get super baked and go on Twitter, follow follow all three of us and just boom. Just to set up your own list and see what we're talking about. Levy, more information. Coffin, good information. My stuff is just absolute nonsense. But you can give the episode a like, subscribe to the Pat Mayo Experience and the DFS Edge anywhere where you can download podcasts free on demand. Bring us with you anytime you like. Catch previous shows in the description for this episode as well, and potentially future shows. He doesn't care. I mean, do it for me. Just do it for, <laughs> do it for me, and do it for Levy, too. Whether he cares or not, do it for him as well. And remember, the show has been brought to you by Jagermeister. Give your beer a shot this summer. 
with an ice cold shot of Jagermeister. For the Adams, I'm Mayo. We'll see you next time. Experience! Experience!